Welcome to the First Right Podcast, a weekly conservative news show brought to you by Restoration of America. I'm your host, Nick Jeebus, and today we're very excited to have with us Liz Collin. She's a journalist and producer of the groundbreaking film, The Fall of Minneapolis, which explains in detail what really happened during the George Floyd case and subsequent riots. Liz, great to have you on the show. You have quite an interesting background that led you to write the book that this film is based on. And I've seen the movie, by the way. I think it's brilliant and at the same time very disturbing. It feels like so much information got left out of the mainstream media's narrative about the case. So tell us about your previous occupation and what led you to write the book that's titled They're Lying, the Media, the Left, and the Death of George Floyd. Thank you for for having me on uh, and and taking an interest uh, in in all of this because this really did change so much for for so many of us. But yeah, I was a mainstream media reporter uh, for 20 years uh, b- before all of this and kind of landed my dream job back home in in Minneapolis, Minnesota, uh, back in 2008, where I worked for for almost uh, 15 years in, in all. Um, but I had a unique perspective in all of this in the fact that I was married, uh, am married uh, to a Minneapolis uh, police officer. He's he's retired now, but he was the union president at the time uh, that this all took place on uh, May 25th of, of 2020. Uh, so I was privy to a lot of information uh, th- through him and, and, and such, but but really was so bothered as a journalist uh, because there was so much information that we were leaving out in our reporting. Uh, journalists turned into activists kind of right right before my eyes. I ultimately finished out my, my contract in mainstream media and left for independent journalism, uh, you know, and was able to put this put this book out and and this documentary really just to set the record straight because I think people are just tired uh, of being lied to uh, after after so long. Amen to that. I worked in the mainstream media as well and left for this job, so I can definitely relate to you there. It's lost its uh, objectivity. And the information you present in this film, it's startling. It, it shows a justice system that's withered away. It doesn't seem to exist anymore. Derek Chauvin and the others, it looks like they were sacrificed and offered up to this woke mob. In your opinion, how does something like that happen? How did we get to this point? Yeah, and there are there are many people, um, yeah, or many questions. I, I should say that just don't have answers uh, at this point. That is, in fact, uh, one of them. And, and why we just wanted to lay this out. These are really just facts, as controversial as those seem to be uh, nowadays. And people can make their make up their own mind. But I think it's very apparent from talking uh, to these families, uh, to the police officers, not only involved, uh, but the police department uh, in Minneapolis, that in so many ways was also sacrificed uh, to to the mob. But you know, is this really what we want? Want our you know so-called justice system to to look like, and we have to answer that question as as citizens of of this country. And we do have power to to push back uh, against this by holding people accountable. Accountable. It's supposed to be the job of of the media, uh, but but it seems that that they kind of fell for all of this uh, hook, line, and sinker as well. And also there was this culture of fear. I mean, I experienced that uh, where I was working before. Um, the mob came after came after me. They they showed up at my doorstep several times uh, for for different protests that took place that summer. You know, not only demanding that I lose my career, but that I be killed uh, in, in the wake of this. Um, as crazy as that sounds, that's reality. That's that's what was happening. Uh, but for too long, I think people ha- have been fearful to to speak up and, and speak out against this. And I hope this will uh, change some minds that that we need more people um, to do just that. You mentioned people willing to go to the extreme. And we learned just days ago that Derek Chauvin was stabbed and seriously injured in prison. Do you think the timing of this documentary had anything to do with it? And do you think the prison system did all it could to protect them? Yeah, we obviously we're heartbroken to hear about the news. And it's so troubling, the, the timing of all of it. Uh, Derek Chauvin had been in that facility in Tucson, Arizona, a medium security facility for 15 months when this took place with no issues uh, at all. His uh, mom had talked about how he felt safe there. I've been in touch with him and there were never any um, issues that that he let on. Um, and it's also interesting, too, that the, the man who put him there in the first place, this is the attorney general of Minnesota, who was the head of the prosecution in this case, he's the the first one uh, to get any sort of health update uh, on Derek Chauvin after this stabbing. And he quickly says that he's uh, stable and expected to survive. But that news is channeled to uh, Attorney General Ellison days before his own family, Derek Chauvin's family, receives any word at all. And it's been very quiet uh, ever since. There's no information on who's responsible, uh, really anything else beyond uh, Derek being in, in stable condition. So um, the, the timing does seem to be uh, very suspect, but, but sadly, we just don't know uh, much more at, at this point. Reeks of corruption, but I'm not surprised. I'm sure you weren't either. 
What do you think the chances are that Chauvin and the other officers get a new trial, particularly Chauvin having the longer sentence? Is there any chance for justice or is this just the way it is now? Well, you had the U.S. Supreme Court um, come out last Monday, it was, to say that they denied uh, Derek Chauvin's uh, appeal. That's after the Minnesota State Supreme Court did, did the same. Uh, but they also provided no explanation as to why that was. So we don't we don't know why. There are um, some, some different legal maneuvers. I know that his uh, attorneys are exploring. That includes some new evidence that recently came to light, uh, some public depositions uh, that talk about how the prosecutors within Hennepin County were not comfortable with the charges, especially especially against the three other officers, the immense pressure. Uh, they, they felt to charge the officers uh, so much so that they actually withdrew from the case because they said morally and ethically they didn't feel comfortable uh, charging uh, these officers. So we know that that's, uh, that's out there now, and, and they do think that they may be able to, to appeal on, on some sort of new, new evidence. It's certainly a longer road ahead for, for Derek Chauvin uh, than the three others. Their prison sentences are, are between uh, three and five years in prison. Well, we know that Derek... Uh, got nearly 22 years uh, in in prison. Yeah, uh, uh, unbelievable. Let's talk about George Floyd for a moment. He's been deified. I mean, they are treating him like a hero. There's a bronze statue of him in Minnesota, a square named after him. Yet his criminal record is extensive. And I noticed this in your film. You go over a conviction for delivery of cocaine, possession of cocaine, aggravated robbery, theft, robbery with a firearm, list goes on and on. How were these facts obscured from the public and the jury at the time? And was this geared toward a cover-up to crucify Chauvin. Yeah, there's so much uh, about this that was hidden from the public. And also another reason we did the film is, again, here are the facts. You decide if you feel differently if you would have known about this very early on. And these are things that that the police chief knew about. These are things the mayor of Minneapolis knew about, the governor of Minnesota knew about, uh, including this interaction that took place with uh, with George Floyd um, on that day. And the body camera vo- footage is with, withheld from the public, which has never happened uh, in any sort of critical incident uh, involving the Minneapolis Police Department. There's a reason uh, the taxpayers footed the bill for body camera body cameras to go on every uh, cop in, in Minneapolis years ago. Uh, but yet, um, you have you have George Floyd complaining how he can't breathe uh, long before Derek Chauvin arrives on scene. Uh, he himself asks to be laid on the ground after he refuses to compl- comply and be put in the back of a, a squad car. He's denying that he took any sort of drugs. Um, there was much to be said about about his criminal history and uh, moreover, an arrest that took place in, in 2019 that was eerily similar to what uh, transpired in, in 2020. But, but again, in, in 2020, we're told that Minneapolis police never had anything to do uh, with George Floyd. They'd never heard of this guy before. Uh, but then, you know, uh, he, kind of why I titled my book, uh, They're Lying, uh, another one of the lies, because uh, he was the, the subject of an undercover drug investigation that took place in 2019, and his arrest is, is captured on, on camera then. And if you play them side by side, they're very similar. And correct me if I'm wrong, in the documentary, there was talk he had fentanyl in his system and uh, a level that could have OD'd, someone could have overdosed on. Yeah, there, there's so much to be said about the medical evidence that was also really uh, withheld from the public for the most part. Um, you have uh, three times the lethal limit of fentanyl in, in George Floyd's system, along with methamphetamine. More importantly, no strangulation marks, uh, no bruising to his neck, uh, no asphyxiation. Uh, you know, again, we're told this is the most racist police officer and the most racist uh, police incident in, in U.S. history, and the, the medical evidence certainly didn't um, you know, point to any of that. You also have um, George Floyd recently recovering from COVID. Uh, he has a bad heart with 75% blockage in one artery. He has a tumor uh, that mysteriously there are no real tests uh, on that are kind of, that's kind of telling uh, as well. So that there's, medical professionals have kind of described, sadly, uh, George Floyd as a bit of a, a ticking time bomb. Um, and, and officers obviously didn't weren't fully aware uh, of the kind of condition uh, that he was in. Yeah, he was rambling, talking about having been shot previously when he had never been shot. So he was obviously uh, incapacitated. But I want to ask you about the officers uh, again. With these punishments that they were given, we're talking years in prison for police officers. Do you think these punishments are going to deter law enforcement officials in the future from stepping in and doing their job? Because they're going to think, I'm not going to step in. I'm going to get crucified. I'm going to go to jail. Has this affected the mentality of our police nationwide? Oh, 100 percent. Absolutely. Um, and it didn't take very long for that to be the, the case. In the film, we talk about um, why officers uh, decided to leave, and it was just 
just that, sort of the number one response. Uh, not only do they have to worry about losing their job on a daily basis, they they worry about losing their their freedom. And what other profession is that you know is that taking place? Um, so the Minneapolis Police Department lost nearly 40 percent of its uh, force in the wake of all of this, and and obviously this sent the message also across the country. Uh, I I believe there's not a lot of proactive uh, police work happening anymore, um, because why would you go ahead and put that on put that on on the line? Uh, we have the police. police Police departments, in a way, sort of acting like fire departments, uh, coming in after after things, and, it, and it's really too bad. We, we're all less safe, uh, really, really because of of all the lies that were told right here in Minneapolis. So, for the last question, I want to break it down into two parts, and if you could answer the, the first part about the media, uh, members like us of independent media, people in the public eye, what can they do to support this film and the message of the film going forward? You know, I think that uh, we can't be afraid to get this in front of people and to be able to talk about uh, this as well. I think for far too long, many of us have have remained uh, quiet. And, and, you know, he, here I am and I know, you know, you share this similar story, but you can't trust the media, period. <laughs> I know I know I'm sure. still kind of technically, uh, you know, a member, a member of it. But these were daily conversations that I was uh, privy to for, for years, shaping uh, what the public thinks about then things uh, poisoning them in in a sense. I really saw that with law enforcement, how the media covered covered these stories so irresponsibly uh, and helping to poison the public, I believe, in in a certain way. Um, so so I think that, you know, there's something to be said about declining ratings. People just don't watch the news like like they used to. There are, you know, honest journalists out there, for, for certainly. Um, you know, you kind of have to, you know, peck around and, and look for that. But they, they, they are out there. We live in a world now where it's uh, e easy to, to find um, all of that. But I also think that hearts and minds can be changed with the truth, which was another reason we, we put this out there as well. So don't be afraid to... You know, perhaps you have some lib liberal family members, bring them over for Christmas, uh, wa watch the film. Hopefully you guys are all still talking to each other afterward. Um, but I have received a lot of uh, feedback from people that this has uh, changed th their mind. And, you know, and, and, and frankly, they're upset, too, that this was uh, withheld from them for so long. Is there a website or anything our audience members can do that maybe they're not a member of the media, but they're a concerned citizen that can also help support the message of the documentary and, and ask questions about these kinds of things? Yeah, so we're at thefallofminneapolis.com. That's where you can watch the, the film. And again, it is free. It was a crowdfunded effort to get this thing um, made at all. And um, also, I work for a place, uh, Alpha News, alphanews.org. Uh, we're a Minnesota-based uh, independent media company. So you can follow us on, on all the, the social media platforms and such. But we really focus on things that the mainstream media uh, does not cover. And you know uh, very well that there's an awful lot of it. So uh, we're, we're busy here at Alpha News, no doubt. It was encouraging to see under the movie, the banner on the Rumble, that it had gotten over a million views. So it's getting out there, and, and we're glad that you did it. So thank you so much for being with us, Liz. I'm sure it was a difficult topic to cover, but we thank you for your pursuit of truth, and we hope more people get to hear the full story. Thank you very much for having me on. I appreciate it. All right, that's our show for today. Thank you for tuning in and supporting conservative media. Now more than ever, it serves as a necessary counterweight to the left-wing bias that's become so rampant in the press. And don't forget, by working together and staying vigilant, we can bring our country back from the brink. We'll see you next week. First Right, a new kind of news summary without the liberal slant. Every morning, in your inbox, always free. Subscribe by texting First Right to 30161. That's First Right, all caps, one word, to 30161.